Uh, I am uh, Jim Riggins. I'm the chair of the Southeast Colorado chapter of the Colorado Renewable Energy Society. And welcome to our Seacrest uh, guest lecture series. Uh, before I introduce our uh, very special guest for this evening, our guest lecturer for this evening, a few administrative notes. Uh, first of all, uh, some uh, thanks to our co-hosts uh, this evening, uh, Sierra Club and 350 Colorado Springs. Uh, we greatly appreciate um, the outreach uh, to all of your members and help us uh, market uh, this event. Um, and also, uh, if you have any questions this evening, please go ahead and type them into the question section. And at the end of uh, Mr. Benjamin's uh, uh, talk. Uh, I will uh, present him with the um, with the questions. So feel free to type in those um, those questions at uh, any time. Um, let me before we begin the formal introduction here. Here we go. So we are absolutely thrilled. Uh, tonight uh, to have as our um, guest speaker, uh, Mr. Aram Benjamin, uh, the CEO of Colorado Springs Utilities. Uh, he joined Colorado Springs Utilities in 2015 as the general manager of energy supply and was named the CEO in October uh, 2018. Uh, prior to joining Colorado Springs Utilities, uh, Mr. Benjamin was the senior assistant general manager head of the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power's Power System, the nation's largest municipal utility. Uh, Mr. Benjamin is a professional engineer uh, with a Bachelor of Science degree in engineering from Cal State uh, University, Los Angeles. He has a master's degree in business administration from University of Laverne and a master's degree in public administration from Cal State uh, Northridge. Um, and with that, I would ask uh, Mr. Benjamin to uh, please come up with your audio and video and we can begin with your lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, thank you for the uh, introduction and I just want to take a minute and thank all the uh, attendance attendees here. I know you had a long day and, and this is very uh, nice to see the number of participants and I'm hoping to kind of give you a little bit of a background of uh, the topics that interest you and hopefully at the end of the uh, conversation we can have lots of questions and answers and just kind of address your uh, specific concerns or questions that you want me to answer so I'm looking forward to that part of the uh, presentation but um, as Jim mentioned, uh, you know, I think the future of the uh, city of Colorado Springs is very bright and we have we have had a, a uh, historic decision that was made by our board, our uh, chair, uh, Gabler, uh, you know, uh, and the entire board uh, had a great uh, discussion about the future of the city and the decision was made uh, June 26 board meeting, you know, for us to kind of chart the, the the roadway for us to uh, map the future of the city. So with that, if Jim, if you can go to the next slide. Uh, just a, 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 just a, a brief agenda. And I'm, I'm, I'm planning on taking less than 30 minutes to finish all the uh, slides here and I'm go to questions and answer. But I just wanna kind of give you a brief uh, uh, highlight of the uh, the background of the Colorado Springs utilities and what we do, and most of you already know that. And uh, most exciting is to kind of cover the sustainable energy plan that we have for uh, plan for the next uh, 30 years. Some of the strategies on the renewable uh, front, you know, what we're doing on the solar, wind, and batteries, and the integration of all all these uh, efforts that we're putting in as far as the customers and how they see us uh, integrate all these parts and, and uh, what they would like to see from a utility, public utility that they own. So with that, next slide. Um, our, our mission is to provide safe, reliable, competitive uh, price 
you know, four services. And we're lucky to have four service capabilities. And a lot of the public utilities, there are probably one or two of these services. But uh, at Colorado Springs Utilities, we are fortunate to be able to provide these very essential services to our customers. Uh, and, and our mission has always been um, reliability, the public safety, employee safety. Uh, we want to make sure our services are reliable and affordable. And I think we've kept that uh, mission focus as we move forward to the next generation. Our goal is to de deliver quality. Uh, some of the things that I've been uh, focusing on uh, that, that Jim highlighted since I took the job in uh, 2018 is, uh, is the commitment to the community. And I think everything we do, we always have the grassroots of the community um, uh, supporting us, uh, being informed of what we're doing. And, and we owe our customers uh, the organizational focus and the organizational um, excellence that they deserve. You know, as we put these plans, we want to make sure that our uh, citizens of Colorado Springs know that our organization is always focused and dedicated to serving them. Next one. This is the uh, <clears throat> part that uh, I want to spend a little bit of time on how we got to June 26 decision that the board made. And again, I, I, I said it's historical because I think, uh, I think it was the effort of the entire community. We go to the next step, Jim. Uh, it was the effort of the entire community that came together. We spent close to uh, 18 months having constant communications of everybody in the city all the stakeholders that we have, and, and we've heard every one of you, um, you know, uh, give us fee feedback on what we're thinking versus what you want us to focus on. And these pillars that we uh, have highlighted had resonated with our customers and our citizens, our, our board, our elected officials. Uh, they all wanted to make sure that whatever we do is innovative, um, you know that we have resiliency and reliability because we want to attract um, our military is extremely important here in, in the city and the region our environment was something that we asked the uh, our our ratepayers and our customers to chime in about where how ambitious can we be as we move forward and then of course everything that we're doing must have must take into account the affordability and the economy uh, given all the uh, all the priorities that we're juggling, and next, uh, you know, uh, we we uh, we have committed, uh, you know, the the uh, the outcome of our efforts and our input from our customers have have uh, have have really given us the results that I think everybody should be proud of here. Um, the entire uh, citizenry uh, and and the input that uh, we got, I think, I think the plan we have, uh, uh, you know, got approved by the board is something that everybody should be proud of because some of these things that we want to do, although they're very ambitious and very, um, you know, high reaching goals, but I think we can do it. We have, we have the capability and the desire and the stomach to move forward with this thing. So uh, some of these things that you've heard about the, uh, uh, you know, the benefits to our customers, and I'll cover some of these uh, uh, advancements that we're doing on technology and, and the customer support uh, areas. But I think the reduction of our emissions uh, by 2030 uh, to about 80% of what we what we had back in 20, 2005 is, is a huge step forward. And, and again, we're not going to rest at 80% reduction by 2030, but I think having a goal such as 80% uh, reduction is a great yardstick for us to shoot for and then and then see if we can uh, surpass that goal our renewables are going to play a huge role as we move forward because i think uh i think it was very clear the direction that we got from our board is that we need to do everything in our power to make sure that when we add our resources that we have uh renewables as uh, energy efficiency and conservation as the cheapest and the most way for us to conserve uh, the resources that otherwise we would spend on building power plants and technology and all those things that we must do. But I think 
having that uh, vision of having uh, conservation and energy efficiency as the as the goal, uh, first goal that we want to put in place was very clear. Second is having uh, to replace our coal generation by 2030. So by December 2029, Colorado Springs utilities will have zero coal in, in their portfolio. And the technology that we're going to use, and I'll cover a little bit more about the emissions that will come in because we're adding uh, uh, 180 megawatts of gas to uh, to shut down uh, Drake um, by by no later than 2023. But but our our projections are we're going to we're basically going to get there next year, which is which is something that is was was uh, unachievable a couple of years ago. But I think it's reality now, and I'll give you a little bit of a background of where we are. We're making huge headways in towards that goal. So next, uh, Jim. So uh, Martin Drake, everybody knows uh, where Martin Drake is, and uh, we have three units there. One of them has been shut down, and then the other two are still available on dual fuel, uh, coal and gas. And as I mentioned, uh, you know those those units are necessary because the city was built around that uh, those two uh, at that uh, you know because of that power plant, the city grew around it, and for us to discontinue using the source of energy from that, we have to do some uh, expansion of transmission and upgrades to our systems, which we are way in our, you know, we're way advanced in, in getting those things done. And I think by, uh, by next year, we will have the system upgraded where unit six and seven will be basically uh, shut down. And then in, in its place, you're gonna go to the next one, Jim. Uh, uh, Oh, I'm sorry. Um, just, just one more. Uh, just going back to to Drake to finish up the uh, the concept of of what we're going to be doing there. So, what we're what we want to put in there is is temporary gas generation unit because that's what's going to uh, replace the coal units, and that's what that's going to allow us to shut them down next year. But we're going to have gas generation in the, in that part until the grid is upgraded, and we're looking for. Uh, 2023 or 2024 timeline where that grid is going to be upgraded and then what we will do is is uh, dismantle those temporary units the gas units and take them uh, southeast corner of the city where we already have a place for them to be installed and uh, and that will be their permanent uh, location next uh, Jim so uh, when it comes to renewables uh, we have we have a 20% goal uh, and we are way into reaching that goal and surpassing it. Uh, next slide. Uh, we, have, uh, we have run the models that, uh, that it's going to basically take us from where we are to where we're going to have uh, uh, about 270 megawatts of solar generation in our system. And our system peak is about 1,000 megawatts. So you can see how we are pushing the limits of how much of these mix of solar and wind we can have in our system. Uh, next. And when, when we are integrating uh, these, uh, uh, these renewables, you know, we're bringing in uh, uh, wind uh, from northeast corner of the state to our system, and we're putting in a lot of the uh, 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 solar generation we we must look at this in as a, in a holistic perspective and this slide that you're looking at it basically uh what i talked about is the green slice of the of the pie you know we have to make sure those those generation are all being uh integrated and brought to the system but we also must look at our infrastructure so what is a transmission system distribution system our substation upgrades and we must use technology, and uh, our our technology is going to be key for us to uh, gather the information that we have from these distributed generation and integrate it into our system. So innovation, uh, needless to say, we ha we have to think differently because our system is different, and the way we're going to be growing into this distributed generation world is totally different from what we are used to. When I started in, in uh, in the uh, public power in LA, 1980, 
at that time, uh, the model that we had in, in place, and th that's not that far, you know, 40 years ago, um, the generation, the massive generation and massive transmission system and distribution system was the model that we all got trained on and educated on, and that's what we knew in 1980. But I think the future that we're looking at is totally different. I think that model is no longer in the future. The model that we see in the future is going to be much more uh, distributed, much more uh, green uh, and, and uh, sustainable from the perspective of uh, having uh, distributed generation, whether it's solar on your rooftop or battery in your garage or electric vehicle in your garage that could be controlled. Uh, you know, or supplied or supplemented by the utility. And the last slice in here is the workforce. We have, we have a huge focus on, on the workforce that make up, makes up the, this great organization that we have that are dedicated employees. So we're, we, we have committed on the Drake and, uh, and I want to cover this a little bit more that we, we have about 90 employees that, uh, that ran uh, Drake Power Plant, and we have about 70 to 80 employees that run Nixon. And we have made the commitment that none of the employees that we have that are working at the Drake coal site uh, are going to be displaced or, uh, or, or, or lose their jobs. So every one of them uh, are, is being retrained, opportunities are opening up, and this kind of goes back to the beginning of the conversation we had is that having four utilities is a very, very huge positive for us because the, the employees that we have trained and we retained to run generation that could easily be transferable to other parts of the organization where we have a huge need for um, the city growth and the infrastructure that we're putting in and the gas and water and uh, you know, wastewater uh, areas of, of, the, of the company. Uh, but we also have uh, new needs for having uh, technicians, you know, instrument technicians, mechanics, you know, um, electricians, that we need them, we need to retrain them for the new world of what the electric system is going to look like. Next. These couple of slides are basically, it's a timeline of how we are going to be transitioning from 2020 to uh, you know, uh, this the slide shows 2035. But if you go to the next one, Jim, is basically um, gives you the current state of where we are. This slide here, the blue section of the slide, is going to go to zero. Uh, the uh, the natural gas um, uh, part is going to be probably going down a little bit, but the in renewables, the solar, the wind. The hydro and the uh, the market uh, interfaces that we have with other utilities are going to be basically um, reinforced, and it's going to be a system that has no coal in it, has natural gas as dispatchable until the time where we have batteries um, uh, mature enough for us to get that orange part down to uh, you know close to zero uh, by 2030. Uh, we have made the commitment that. With the, these units that we're going to add uh, today uh, to replace uh, Drake 6 and 7 are going to be the last gas units that we ever add, add to the system. And we've made the commitment to the board that that's our goal. We're going to work very hard to get there, and I think we can do that. So that orange part is going to be our next um, area where we're going to have to figure out a, uh, a way for us to have storage as the way we store wind and solar and dispatch them when we need them. But right now, the equation all, always has gas in it because of the technology and, and its maturity right now. But I think we, we are confident that within five to 10 years, we're gonna have technology breakthroughs that will make that possible where that orange segment of the, uh, the mix is gonna go close to zero or, or, or maybe zero, but just have a backup system just in case you know, we need that uh, dispatchable and then have that transition made very smoothly to 100% renewables with storage capabilities that we can get into. Next. 
Um, so energy markets, I mentioned it a little bit, but um, the energy markets is something that uh, we, we are slowly getting uh, into our joint dispatch agreement. We have 24-7 um, uh, center in, right now at the utilities where we buy and sell commodities um, and electric uh, purchase and sales are part of that marketing group. We also do a, a real-time exchange of energy between us and our neighboring utilities. The joint dispatch agreement that we have entered with uh, Excel Energy, uh, uh, Platte River, Black Hills, and us as being a four utility entity has already uh, paid uh, dividends you know, from an economic dispatch. So whether we put our resources to the market, the four markets that we have joined um, a, and sell our energy to that market, or we basically back off our generation and buy uh, renewables from the market to to bring it to our system it has paid off uh, dividends and we're going to start publishing those benefits of collaborating with our utilities and that's going to be basically uh, expanding to the west markets um, you know the cal iso market and and having connectivity uh, with the western grid we are all part of the western grid you know california uh, Nevada, uh, you know, all the states, the Western states, including Colorado, we are part of the Western grid of the federal system that we have, the FERC um, uh, mapping that we have, the interconnectivity. So we are going to try to take advantage of the markets and more of the penetration to the renewable markets where we can bring in. And that orange part that you just saw a couple of slides ago, slides ago, um, basically is is the uh, the capacity that we have that we could generate with gas but if we have all these renewable energy coming in that orange uh, slice of the pie will be uh, shrunk to a point where we don't need to put these units on for us to keep the system reliability next Uh, so I, I covered uh, this, uh, but uh, again, uh, the uh, the units that we're buying, and uh, I, I was going to give you a status on where we are with that. So we're we're in negotiations right now with the suppliers, and we will very quickly uh, have uh, the units identified and commitments made for having six 30 megawatts units, and these are, if you can imagine a big trailer truck trailer they, they're a little bit bigger than those trailers that you see on the road uh, they're extremely sophisticated units that could be installed very quickly and the beauty of these units are 30 megawatts each we will have redundancy in our system and these units come from uh, so just to give you a comparison of what we had and, and drake has had its days and it was very important for the city but the technology has advanced so much that by the time we bring uh, the unit six and seven right now, we have to start, uh, uh, you know, uh, startup process. It's going to be anywhere uh, from 10 to 18 hours before we even get the single megawatt out of the, the, the transformer over there. So it's a long uh, period of time for us to push a button and get uh, reaction of the generation uh, that we would get to to feed into the system. Compare that to the units that we're going to put in there. We could push a button, and this is this is all done remotely. We don't even have uh, personnel on the ground on these units. We will push a button, and we will go from zero to thirty megawatts in five minutes. So imagine imagine the difference that we have, the the flexibility that we're putting into the system right now by having these very, very sophisticated units in our systems. The, the markets are, because of the renewables and the variability of what's coming in and, and how to balance the system, these units are, are what we need in order for us to be able to enter the market and, uh, and have these flexibilities of, of turning it on, turning it off. And these units are made for um, tens and and hundreds of times uh, being turned on and off. And there's no uh, downside to having these units cycled that way. So that's what we have. And hopefully uh, by the end of this year, you will see 
physical changes at Drake. So you might see uh, one of the stacks come down. Uh, you might see one of the coolers disappear. Definitely, you're going to see the coal pile go to half. That's what we need the pad for us to be able to put these units on. So you're going to see a shrunk uh, physical appearance of the units or uh, the unit existing unit is going to change. And hopefully by the end of uh, next year or, or maybe October of next year, we will have a total turnoff of the units at Drake and we will start even more aggressively taking down the structures that we have. Next one. I, I covered this um, on our answer questions if you have, but we have the, the major um, infrastructure that I wanted to mention is we need to, to replace the, the organic growth that the downtown Colorado Springs had to, to surround itself by Drake that was there. And we have a lot of the critical feeders uh, that feed the high rises and, and, and the infrastructure that we have in the downtown area. For us to replace that energy injection from that point, we must bring in a high voltage transmission line from the east side of the city to where Drake is. So instead of having an injection of power uh, from that point, we are bringing in a 115,000 volt transmission line at the center of the city going all the way to the substation that is next to Drake over there. Next, Jim. Technology uh, touched on this. Um, we we have a, a, a very aggressive plan to actually put in a network, a fiber and communication network that we want to beef up. We already have a very good network of uh, fiber in our uh, city systems and we want to look at strategically what else we can do in order for us to have a very robust uh, communication uh, platform. And this is because what I just mentioned before is that our, our model of how the grid is going to look like is going to be different. And we have to be ready for us to have that connectivity with the batteries and the solar and having charging station all over the city that could actually make our transportation backbone by having view of uh, where these charges are, how they're being dispatched you know, to, to charge cars, and what would it look like? Our biggest investment that we have right now, and it's currently on the way, is the, the automated meter infrastructure, which is basically a two-way cellular communication to every house we serve, every address we serve. So that project is underway. It's 120 plus million dollars that we're investing in exchange. So next time you see the meter next to your house, that's a that's an old technology, although we were first to put this AMR system. That is a one-way communication. The meter talks to us. Now we want to be able to talk to the meter when we put these things in. Next. Uh, so I'll just skip this one. I'll, I'll cover it if there's any questions. And the workforce I've already covered. Um, we we want to do uh, a very uh, organized uh, feeder, non-skilled labor that we want to hire on all four services. And again. The Drake uh, employees and the Nixon employees that uh, we will have down down the road, uh, they they are perfectly positioned for them to be uh, retrained and reintegrated into our utilities. But we also want to reach out to the communities and hire uh, non-skilled labor that are willing to go into our apprenticeship programs for us to spend three years, four years with them, train them on very very good paying blue collar workforce that we want to create. And we want to, uh, you know, have a very skilled workforce that will be able to take us to all this vision that we have, uh, you know, for us to to achieve. Next one. Uh, I can skip this one, Jim. Next one. Uh, this is my my favorite here, uh, and this is where this picture probably will be a historic picture because if you fast forward forward twenty years from now. Downtown Colorado Springs will look much, much different than what you see here. And the goal is to, to kind of uh, have an urban center of a city that could actually attract, you know, uh, a new generation of residents that want to walk uh, to the market, that want to live in downtown Colorado Springs, that want to go to school, 
Um, they want to they want to uh, ride their bikes. They want to uh, get on a, a electric buses to to be transported to a music center, to uh, uh, you know restaurants, to walking areas. Uh, the urban development of the city of Colorado Springs is going to be totally different as we move forward. So that blue dot that you see in the middle of the uh, the, the the slide there, Drake will will be will be out of that picture here, and hopefully we'll will have a community input on what that site is going to look like as we move forward. So I think I think just just hang in there. Uh, the the downtown area is going to see some major transformation as we move forward with these plans and get uh, get them implemented as we've told uh, um, you know our board and the community that we want to move forward with. Next. All right, that's almost to the dot, 30 minutes, mm -hmm. Jim. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Benjamin. That was uh, fantastic. And uh, as you mentioned at the beginning, the historic seven to two vote on the 26th of June, uh, it's impossible to uh, overstate um, how how critical and how monumental uh, that was to the future of, um, of Colorado Springs. Um, so I, I, uh, I, on behalf of, of Seacrest and I think on behalf of almost everyone listening here, I want to thank you for your, your leadership and vision in, uh, in making that happen. Um, we have a uh, fair number of questions. I would like to um, kick off with one of mine, if I could, please. Sure. Um, with Colorado Springs undergoing a uh, massive expansion to the east, out to the Banning Lewis Ranch, um, do you have plans to work with developers and builders to encourage beneficial electrification uh, and remove um, or not even build homes with combustion appliances in them uh, now that the grid is becoming much cleaner? We have, we have started the communication because part of it is the vision of our board and the comments that we've gotten from the citizens and what we want to see. And, and the, the critical uh, players, and this is the developers and, and the community de developers or the planners of the future and those communities. So, um, and again, these parts that I talked about come into play. So the fiber optics or the communication infrastructure that we want to have uh, into these new developments is key. Because one of the things, Jim, we want to do is not only distributed generation, uh, traditional, you know, solar on your rooftop, uh, battery in your garage, but we want to have a, a community that has a community storage uh, installed as we develop these places. So uh, if you can imagine a cul-de-sac with five or six homes and a basically a community storage where the access electricity that's generated from those homes can be stored and it will be a virtual power plant that these homes kind of draw the energy from. The utility will be connected to the battery as a backup and we will fill the battery and we will withdraw the batteries based on the system needs. But those are all conversations that we're having with the community and I'll tell you, they are probably so excited about Kind of envisioning with us the future and what is going to look like uh you know if you if we can have and i had this conversation yesterday with one major developer i said when we're building homes it's probably the cheapest way for us to actually envision what that future home looks like so if it's a ev ready or solar ready i, I might decide not to put solar now on my roof uh because of any reasons but the house should be ready to be plugged in when when the uh, when the owner is ready to put in. So you don't have actually it's cheaper to do it up front and have those standards in place, uh, and and then we can add solar on top. We can plug in a battery in the garage. Uh, we can have a charging uh, station in the garage for electric vehicle. And they were very very excited to have that. And we're going to have more of these meetings with the developers and the engineers to figure the next steps. But uh, your question is, yes. Thank you. Let me start going through um, some of the questions. Um, 
starting with the the most important, what are the what are the three most significant challenges that we face for the transition? It, so, so I, it's kind of lines up with the uh, with the uh, balancing act that we had. Uh, at, you know, when we when we when we are looking at what's the best fit, we said we want a system that's extremely reliable. So, I will I will say that reliability comes uh, with a cost associated with it, and doing it the right way. And you 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 all are reading some of the things that could go wrong if this reliability is not done in a proper, it's physics. It's, it, it, it's just the way you transition from current state to uh, where you wanna go. But in between, you might have three steps for us to go through and having the patience for us to do it right and do it the right way and invest properly. That's one challenge because of the, the uh, economics and the way we we have our revenues uh, coming in, but it's not a challenge we cannot overcome. So reliability is not negotiable. We're not gonna put the city in danger. We're not gonna do things that are gonna be half-baked, you know, as we move forward. We're gonna do it right. For that, we're gonna need to invest the right way and actually execute on those things. So that's one challenge is the is balancing between, you asked for three, but I'm, I'm kind of, <laughs> putting them together because they are related with each other. So cost uh, and, the, and the rate that we go right now, the strategy that we have in place is actually gonna reduce the pressure on rates. So we're gonna shut down unit six and seven, and actually it's gonna reduce our revenue requirement while we buy new units and put them there. If we can figure these moves in a way that is actually going to uh, take some pressure off. We all, we're going to invest on, on infrastructure. This transmission line that we want to build from the east to the to the south, south central downtown, uh, Colorado Springs, it's going to cost us $50 million or so uh, to build. So that's that's a positive pressure on, on the rates. But the more we can take these old technology and replace them with new technology, I think we can manage that that balance that we will strike. But the other thing is is is, is change management. I, I, I'll put it in a broad brush. But again, you know, this, this whole thing is exciting to me to have this entire community come together and have this positive force of thinking that we need to, we need to move forward. And that to me is very exciting and the change management and the way we respond to that is is human behavior and cultural change and things that we have to do and and again it's hard it's very hard for people to let go of uh you know what they're used to and and, and i think the biggest thing is to give assurance to everybody that that we are going to be together we're going to move forward together don't have anxiety of what the future holds because we're not taking anything that is going to put us in jeopardy. We actually, we actually can pull this together as we move forward. So that that takes meetings like this because, to me, the more we sit down and talk together like this, the more, um, you know, how many people are? I see 46 people here. I hope all of you will have you know, uh, friends and family and people that you can talk to so you can get more excitement with this future that we hold. But I like this kind of energy because it's not it's not one person or one group or another. It's a it's it's a whole community effort going forward. But change management is a challenge for us to move in a right pace forward. The, uh, your comments on uh, community involvement are a great segue into the next question. Uh, we as citizens are owners of the land on which uh, Drake is located. How do we ensure sufficient cleanup of the remains of the former coal gasification plant? And how do we have input into the future use of the land? So, so we, we have, uh, we are not there yet, but, but I'll tell you what, what our thinking is, is that is a public land owned by the by the citizens of the city. 
uh, you know, they paid for it, it's their land, they have to have an input on what goes in there. I tell you what I don't want to see personally, again, this is my, my own, pers I don't want to see it, a U-Haul storage facility there or something that is totally out of whack uh, from what the city, I think, deserves. I think the city deserves, uh, it's the gateway to the city. I think the public deserves something that is fitting to the stature of the of the city. I think this is a city that is a proud city. You know, you can see the, uh, the development going on there with the museum, with the stadium. So we got to figure out a, a public input forum for us to get the input of the public to what they want to see there. And I, I'd like to be part of that. And I'm hoping three years from now, we, we can have this conversation of what will go there. But the cleanup is dependent on, again, what will be uh, the land used for. So if it's going to be, I'm, I'm just bringing an example. If it's going to be a, um, a common public gathering area where you have, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, kind of a, a joint use, uh, restaurants, walking space, park, something like that. The cleanup might be light in that area. We don't even know the extent of the uh, the um, contaminants that we have there. We we definitely, almost definitely, know that we have something to to clean up there, but we don't know the extent of it until we take the buildings down. But I think it's going to be a good process that we will put in place, and the public is going to have a voice in what goes in there. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Um, I believe you 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 covered this um, quite thoroughly in your comments, uh, but there are a number of people have asked a very similar question, which is which is um, does CSU have a plan for job transitions for its staff as CSU switches from coal to renewable energy sources? Um, in in addition to the comments you made uh, during your your formal presentation, do you have anything more to add to to that? It's it's a commitment, and I, and I had a meeting today with our human resources department. It's a commitment I made, and I will I will never violate that commitment. I I I said this maybe a thousand times. The people uh, the our employees that are that have put their lives online. And they ran that those that power plant. They are not going to be left alone uh, for them to figure out what the next chapter looks like. We owe them the uh, the honor and the and the resources that they need for them to transfer. And I tell you, every one of them is is extremely highly trained, highly capable, highly motivated employees that we have. They're going to have a place. We have we've already started the transition. So, for example, uh, some of the employees that we have at Drake, because we're not running it as 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 much as we ran before, because of the renewables and, and other sources of energy that we're we're bringing in from the JDA, from the Joint Dispatch uh, place. We're not running the units as as much as we ran them before. We are already uh, uh, transitioning our employees to different areas like for example the gas system needs a lot of help in in uh, in getting uh, uh you know crews lined up and quality inspections and all those things that we need to do perfect match from where they were doing uh what they were doing at drake to getting them trained to moving them into uh the new areas and they are excited themselves i mean it's a new career it's a new day it's a new a uh, new uh, life uh, that they have in doing different things that they didn't do before. But it, but it is something that we have, we have put together a plan way before the decision was made in June 26, because we knew whether it's 2024 or 2025, 2027, the end of Drake was somewhere in between those years. And for us to wait for those years and then plan, was a bad idea. So we have something called an integrated, just like an IRP, it's an integrated human resource plan, which is very much detailed plan on how these resources can be transitioned. So if anybody wants to see or 
get more detail. This is probably the most passionate thing for me to to tell everybody. And I and I said this to many of outside agencies is the the engineering of of taking a unit down and putting a unit down up, putting a transmission line in. And we we have done these many many times over. It's the easy part. The hard part is doing all these things and keeping the the people that that does the core of our organization keeping them whole is tougher to do because you hear these transitions with other utilities and this is where public utility comes you hear these these companies we're shutting down coal oh by the way we're laying off 600 people i mean you hear these these two things happening and, and in our case we have zero displacement of our workforce Uh, next question. Um, as a 39-year resident of Colorado Springs, uh, CSU has had a reputation of taking very conservative directions in the future of CSU activities. What we learned over the course of this last year was that CSU and the environmental and conservation communities are on the same page. Uh, what can we do to develop and enhance this relationship so that we can work together to achieve the objectives uh, that we must achieve for future generations? It's a, it's, a, it's a great, like I said, it's a great energy to have not just, not just a certain group, but the, to have the entire cross-section of the community, I think, came together. Not because I, we, didn't want, we, we didn't think, we weren't naive enough that everybody's gonna uh, line up uh, behind a plan. And we're gonna have 100% consensus, we're gonna have 100% celebration. But I think if you ask, anybody in the community that that we have gone above and beyond uh just a reasonable reaching out to the communities i mean we've done everything to bring all the voices together to formulate this thing i think i think the alliances are are extremely exciting i think it just gives people people hope that you can actually get things done and, and you have this alignment of, of vision of where we want to do. I think sustainability to me is something, uh, it's, not, it's not a slogan or it's not something we want to say or, or just kind of, uh, uh, you know, just not have plans that support that. But I think we want to do more uh, to show how a utility should look like in the future. And then let everybody be proud of it. And, and I think, I think this is the difference that we are seeing that that alignment. That we are all talking about the same thing. We are all talking about the future of, of our generation to be protected, to be uh, sustainable, to be uh, to be something we can all say we've left something for them that is much better than what we inherited. Uh, you know, when when we took over this company or this city. So I think you're going to see more of that and i hope that this is the beginning of partnerships that we will create thank you uh the next question um is i i follow up from the beneficial electrification question for new construction and it it, it applies to existing uh housing uh, do you have any plans um to help folks move away from natural gas uses such as rebates or incentives uh, for electric appliances over gas powered appliances we we are we are looking at, at all our dsm programs and our, our rebates programs and your question is is uh, is something that we want to make sure that not only we we say where we want to go but we also incentivize uh, people and right now as far as the cost go uh, our electric rates are are very competitive. So I think the the part of the distributed generation that I spoke about, you know, the battery installation, the the, the community battery, or or the uh, microgrids, if you want to call them, um, when when we have those in place and the communities that we are building, kind of people see how that looks like. I think you're going to see some some traction on uh, electrification and. And again, if we're going to go with the, uh, you know, more of the technology, and are we going to have a resilient grid 
and we're going to have renewables and, 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 and go in that direction, electrification makes sense because it will give you the redundancy, it will give you the cost advantage, and it will give you the reliability that you need. Um, and we had this conversation today where I was in a meeting and one person said, I went 100% electric and I thought I would never uh, say this, but I will never go back to gas because I love the stove, I love the heater, I love the, the, uh, uh, the appliances that I didn't know that it can perform. But, you know, uh, some, some preconceived ideas about it's more expensive, it's more clumsy, it's more unreliable, it's, uh, you know, all these conceptions, we need to start breaking that so, so we can have a choice, you know, you know going that direction. Speaking as someone who lives in an all electric house, I would concur with that uh, with that sentiment. Um, there are a couple of similar questions here on the uh, natural gas generators. Um, one, are they uh, combined cycle? Another, uh, how large or what size uh, will the units be? Uh, um, to answer both of those, Aram, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to uh, the difference between an aero derivative uh, generator and a, um, a a more permanent structure of a combined cycle. Yeah, so these are simple cycle units. So uh, just like your airplane, you know, if you're sitting on the wing and you look down and you see the engine uh, the, and it says GE engine on it, you know, on a Southwest airline, they they are they are very much similar to that technology. It's a turbine. Uh, that sits on a trailer uh, that has a packaged uh, unit, you know, all the controls, uh, all the uh, connectivities and everything are on a trailer. Uh, and these are 30 megawatts each. So 30 times 680 megawatts of generation that we will put next to each other. And these can come on uh, each on their own, or they can all start all at the same time and they could run all at the same time. And that's that's where we have that redundancy and the the flexibility of turning these units on and off. The permanent location. Uh, this is another uh, exciting uh, vision that we will have more details for you. And hopefully, I'll I'll be either I can come back to this forum and, and give a report on that, or any one of you is welcome to come over and we'll spend some time talking about this. It's the advanced technology center that we're going to be building. Uh, uh, southeast corner, so south of the airport, a little bit to the east, Mark Shuffle and Drennan. We have just closed on 160 acres of land in that area. So imagine 160 acres of land that we have there. And these units that we have at Drake temporarily are going to be basically uh, relocated to that place. So we're already building planning to build the uh, pads for them and, and the location. That's just a small portion of the 160 acres that we have there. That area is gonna be like a mini lab of uh, uh, test labs for batteries, distributed generation, and we might put in uh, you know, 15, 10 to 15 megawatts of solar on that land that could be used to figure out the grid of the future there. So. If any one of you have been to NREL, you know, in Golden, Colorado, uh, the national lab, uh, imagine those, those centers of research and development and testing of what the system should look like. We're gonna have a mini, uh, a mini campus there where we're gonna have these generators there. We're gonna have a nerve center for all the distributed generation information that will come in to that control room. So we, Right now we have a, we just closed on it a couple of days ago. So I'm talking about a bare land. So if you pass by there, you're gonna see nothing but a bunch of grass there right now. But that area is gonna be transformed into a high-tech uh, center that we will have all these ideas that we have about the future uh, of the city might be a little lab there that we would demonstrate of how the city is gonna look like in a smaller scale that people can see, can feel good about the technology and how we're gonna be running it. And then we will expand it to, 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 uh, you know, to the city. So that's, that's our vision uh, of the future. So those generators are very much reliable. Uh, 
uh, flexible. Uh, we will install them in less than two months and they will be running uh, and they will performing and then we will dismantle them and take them over to that site uh, for the permanent locations that we're going to put them there. Very good. Um, next question. Uh, as coal mines in Wyoming are likely to shut down due to market forces, is there a danger that Colorado coal power plants will also shut down on dangerously short notice? We don't. We don't see that. Um, I think. I think we have enough. Uh, enough. Uh, we're kind of moving quicker than some other coal plants, so we we won't be caught in that window where we're the last one to turn the lights off, and then we we will run out of uh, uh, coal. But but I, again, you know, uh, so coal, uh, two hundred and uh, megawatts of coal is going to disappear next year. So basically, they'll. 200 megawatts of coal will go out of our system. So no longer you're going to see trains coming into Drake because we're, we'll be done with coal at Drake. Nixon will be the only one left. And this is no later than uh, December 2029, which is what the board has directed us to do. But again, if we see an opportunity for us to have technological advancement, things that we could do, I mean, the, 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 the guidance is no later than December 2029. So if we can come up with a way for us to displace uh, Nixon, which much, much more economical options that we have and much more, much better options that we could put in there, it could be much sooner than 2029. I'm not going to give the name out, uh, which is in this question, but uh, uh, let's see. So. Uh, I am a student at CU Boulder studying mechanical and energy engineering. First of all, thank you for uh, attending tonight. You are the future. I appreciate that. Uh, and this student has uh, two questions. Is Colorado Springs Utilities uh, additionally investing in renewable and energy efficiency incentives for residential customers? Uh, and what research and and investments have been done to increase the reliability of distributed grids uh, through developing technology such as smart metering and other advanced electric grid systems. So, so the answer to the first question is I, I, I said, you know, all our portfolio had energy efficiency and demand response uh, as the cheapest and the best resource to have at the front of this whole conversation about solar and wind and batteries, because if we flatten the curve and we actually control the usage of the commodity, uh, and it's kind of counterintuitive, but at, we, we have a, a very good economic justification that that is the cheapest way for us to add resources when we need to. So wasting energy is not economical, uh, and it has nothing to do with any, anybody that can afford it or not afford it, because that's not a, this is not the issue. But I think we have incentives for uh, small business uh, lighting programs, for example. You know, we want to make sure all our programs are also, uh, you know, su uh, supporting businesses. We want that money that they're paying uh, for the utility bills to be reinvested in the business to hire more people to use technology for their businesses. We want them to succeed in their businesses. So the, the less expense or burden we are on them, the better they will be. So we have a very good uh, program. If, uh, if the, the person who asked the question, if you can go on our website and you could email me and you could email anybody on that uh, team uh, and they will give you more information on, on what we're doing. And, and I'm telling you right now, full disclosure, we're we're not at the level that we should be. So, uh, you know, we're not going to be happy until we get to that level where we actually have a very robust program in there because we have very aggressive goals. On the distributed generation, technology, as I mentioned, is going to play a big role. So right now we're changing the meters. And basically they're, they're cell phones in a, in a big box you know, that reads your usage and all four utilities, uh, you know, gas and water are also going to be automated. 
So that device that you're going to have next to your house is the device that we will we will talk to, and it will talk to us, and we could send commands to that device. So if you can imagine, you know, if we if we send somebody to disconnect right now, it's a manual disconnect. Uh, we will we will stop sending people uh, to to the disconnect or reconnect uh, because we're going to use technology to do that. And then as far as the uh, distribution automation, you know, the student, if if you're taking any classes on on uh, on on uh, uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning, where we have these millions of points of data coming into a control room. Uh, that is that is the future. So uh, we're going to put 230,000 devices, and we have to have the capacity for us to uh, view multiple thousands of data coming in, sort through them, organize them, and then turn it over to operations for us to either uh, do something with it or or send an order to the machines for them to do something that we want them to do. So uh, we're we're still growing into it, but that's the future. So in your briefing, you mentioned the uh, battery energy storage system. The next question asks, are there any plans for increasing pump storage facility or adding another one? Um, and let me expand on that too with a, a question of my own that I'm curious about. Uh, other energy storage technologies such as uh, high mass gyroscopes, compressed air, uh, hydrogen generation. Are you looking at other forms of energy storage? Yes, to all of them. We, we already have uh, pump storage right now. It's a small pump storage that we have from um, in our system. Uh, but we, all, we are always looking. Uh, I remember back in the 70s, you know, when LA, uh, we built, uh, we built 1200 megawatts of pump storage. At that time, uh, batteries were just spoken about, you know, that was the, the, the most uh, efficient batteries that we had built uh, because of the, uh, the cycling of the energy, you know, pumping, being pumped up and, and, and run it at the time that you use it. And also the dispatchability of pump storage because it is a push of a button for the units to come online and balance the system. So it's a perfect battery for, for having the system stability. But I think uh, our storage capability right now, it's, it's there, it's small, but we're always going to look for opportunities to partner. We don't have a natural uh, location where we can, we can have uh, big scale pump storage, but we're also always looking for partnership. And that's where the joint dispatch uh, comes into play because we can reach far in, into a system where we can have that pump storage available for us to put in access generation because the last thing you want when we invest in wind and solar is for you to have access generation where you have to put the throttles on and control it. You don't want to control renewables. They need to generate as much as they can generate and don't put the brakes on them. What you need is if you are generating more than you need, you need to have a storage for you to store that electrons because Next day, you might need those electrons when the clouds come in or the wind doesn't blow. So that's the kind of view that we have. We're always scouting for uh, opportunities for app to storage because uh, batteries are there and we're gonna put 25 megawatts of batteries in our system here very quickly, but that's 25 megawatts of storage that is the first and the biggest in Colorado. Uh, but we don't have experience in operating, which we will get. We don't know the characteristics of the battery, which we will learn. But pump storage, it's been around for, you know, more than 100 years. Um, there are a number of similar questions I'm going to try to combine into one, and it has to do with uh, reaching 100% uh, renewable energy. Um, when might that uh, be able to happen and what kind of investment would it take uh, to reach 100% renewable energy? Right now, uh, the studies, the, the available technology and the studies that we've all looked at and studied is that penetrating renewables up to 
uh, 80% is achievable right now for a reasonable price. But going from 80 to 100 is a steep climb right now because of the technology and what we have. But my hope, and I think everybody that I've talked to, that, that the technology uh, will, will be in place for us. By the time we beef up the grid and get ready for us to have distributed generation, technology will keep up with it. And, and, and the only time, um, and, and you, you are reading the, uh, the issues in California of the blackouts, uh, is that, and, and not all of it is physics. So, so if anybody wants to talk more in details, I can talk about what has happened. It's, it's more of, a, of an organizational structure and communication and coordination of what, what, uh, what has happened there. It's not all physics, but also physics has to do something with it when you strip down the organizational issues. You come to a capacity that, uh, that either was missed and the dispatchable units that they had were either not available or, or they couldn't put enough uh, generation in time for the grid to be balanced. So we don't wanna make those mistakes. I think, I think we have to be very careful about uh, uh, you know, relying on something that doesn't exist, but we're not gonna do that. So anytime, if, if we lose right now, in our system right now, if we lose every renewable that we have and we lose the battery that we have, we will still have a reliable system. So, so when the fires came on, uh, you know, a week ago, uh, you know, generate solar generation took a dip uh, because of the cloud cut or the haze cover and, and the way that it was generation. So it took, it took a hit on the generation side. So if that happens, we have enough machinery in place for us to be able to replace that energy. But I think 100% renewable is achievable. In my opinion, we are about maybe 10, 10, 15 years away from having reliable technology that will take us there. I'm surprised we only had two of the following question. I thought it would be uh, the first on the list. Um, as you add renewables, uh, how will that impact uh, bills? And uh, a similar question was, how much will the average residential bill increase uh, under this plan? So, so renewables, uh, just to give you an idea on, on renewables, and this is a, um, uh, a two-part question. So energy to energy. So you take energy from coal right now or gas and then you take energy from renewable. And right now the prices are, renewable energy is half the price of fossil. The other part of the equation that we need to add to is all the investments that we need to have in order for us to use 100% of the renewables generated in there. So the, the, the example I brought is the, is the uh, uh, to transmission line that we're going to put in, $50 million investment. We're doing that because we want to beef up our grid for us to take advantage of the, the cheap prices that we're seeing on the solar and wind. So solar is two cents, coal is four and a half cents. And, and the, uh, the reason why the fossil is, is not, ha it doesn't have an adder because we have already invested in the grid and we have the wires to take that four and a half and it's four and a half cents to distribute it. On the generation side, on the renewables, we're getting it at two cents, but we don't have the wires for us to get it in there. Once we invest in the wires, you have a, a locked price of two cents for the next 25 years. That itself is a huge advantage. If I was a business and I bring up the example of, you go to Starbucks and you're paying $5 right now. If you told Starbucks, can you charge me $5 15 years from now? They will throw you out of the store. I mean, no, no business can tell you 15 years from now, you're gonna pay exactly what you're paying right now because of inflation adjustments and all those things. But for the renewables, you, you already have a set 
uh, price for the next 25 years, you have no volatility, you have no uh, issues with supplies, you have no issues on, on you have you have other issues to deal with. You know, you have the clouds and the fires and all those things, but those are all manageables compared to uh, volatility of the fossil fuels that we've seen. Uh, again, you know, it's it's something that we we have to we have to understand these pieces. But uh, if we see a rate increase and it's going to be slide rate adjustments for the next five years, not because of the renewables, but because we're rewiring the system to accept that that new resource that we have. Next question is: Can CSU help support an update to the regional stability, uh, the regional sustainability plan? Excuse me. Uh, can can uh, can it be more specific on which part? That's a that's a loaded question. I can spend eight hours on. It. <laughs> uh, perhaps I can uh, link you up with the uh, the person asking this question to uh, yeah have them email offline. Yeah, have them email me. I'll I'll be happy to spend time with them. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, can you give us an update on the expansion of the transmission lines? Where where we stand today with that? So we are, we are, we have three. We we've divided the uh, the city into three parts. So we have the northern transmission system, the central, and the south. The north and the south areas are light compared to what we have to do for the central part, and that is the rewiring of the Drake system that we have to, to maintain the reliability of the downtown area. So the biggest uh, issue that we have is connectivity from the east to the center of the thing. And that's going to take a, uh, a 115,000 volt high voltage transmission line to be connecting the east to the, the west. And that is that it, the design and the configuration and uh, and a lot of the technical details of where this line is going to be, what it is going to look like, and all those things are way underway. So June 26 is when we got the green light to move forward, and I think we are we are miles ahead of the schedule on on figuring out what this project is going to look like. So we will get to the uh, to the public once we have some specific details of what those projects are going to be and hopefully next time we meet we will have very specific locations, schedules, costs and when we're going to put it in service because that's going to determine when those temporary units that we put at Drake are no longer needed. So once we complete that transmission line then we will dismantle those units and take them to the to the 160 acres that we have southeast corner of the city and that would be permanent location there so uh, i don't have those dates right now for you because of of the finalization of that thing but i can tell you we have we have an army of engineers and planners that are way ahead of schedule on figuring that out the next question is uh, about some of the residents near the Martin Drake plant. Uh, the Mill Street neighborhood has been most affected by Martin Drake as Drake decommissions in downtown are areas uh, change rapidly. Uh, what support will CSU or the city offer in the transition? Uh, and given that some of the Mill Street residents have restrictions on their ability to engage with CSU in the transition, um, are you looking at any type of outreach uh, specifically to that neighborhood? If if I can refer uh, the person who's asking the question to the Mill uh, Mill Street report that was generated, uh, that was pretty. Uh, it was maybe a year old or so, um, and in there they'll find all the the issues of the neighborhood and what the city is planning on doing to make sure that they are protected. You know, as the transition happens, and what else? What else is going on there that's going to impact that, that area there? So, uh, if I think if you go to the uh, to the city website and just type in Mill Street uh, Plan, um, Mill Street Neighborhood Plan, you will you will get a copy of it, and it's a pretty well written document. 
So that's on the city of Colorado Springs website, yes. not the CSU website, correct? I, okay. I'm not sure. I can get back to you. I'm not sure if there's a link from our website to that. But if you go to the city for sure, you would be able to get a copy of it. Um, if anybody listening knows uh, specifically where that report is located, if you just type it in the question, I can uh, read that out um, before we conclude. Uh, have you looked at zinc air batteries? Uh, companies like Zinc 8 Energy can store 500 plus megawatts uh, with scalable cost-effective solutions. We're, we're looking at, uh, so, so these are technologies that are being tested, uh, uh, you know, like San Diego Gas and Air can put in a, uh, a, 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 a utility scale battery, you know, where you have the chemicals on, on different sides of the, uh, the anodes. Uh, and uh, they, they installed it, they're, they're still learning how that battery, any technology that's going to be, right now our best bet is the, uh, uh, the, uh, the traditional, uh, you know, ion batteries uh, that we have. Uh, but uh, uh, but any, any breakthrough that's going to happen, it's going to happen in the material that's being used in the battery construction and its sustainability, you know. So the biggest thing, you know, uh, in, in the technology is the degradation of the material composition of the plates and, and the way they hold charges. And uh, when I was in the uh, uh, Brookhaven National Lab in Long Island, uh, these scientists, they were working on that molecular uh, construction of those plates to see how they can reverse the degradation of those molecules to make sure that the batteries are renewed by, by uh, reversing the uh, degradation cycle of the, the, uh, the structure of the atoms. In the, in the plates. So there's tons of these uh, efforts uh, that, are, that, are being, uh, that are being advanced. And, and I think it's gonna happen where, where we have uh, either perfected the technology that we have today and made it more uh, safe and reliable and, and the longevity is there. I mean, you could see that in, in uh, car battery technology. I mean, this is, I remember the GE uh, EV1 uh, car back in the 80s uh, and, and everybody was celebrating because it was going 25 miles on one charge. Uh, and now you have, you have people are, 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 are happy with, and they were seeing 200 plus miles per charge. Uh, so that's all advancements in technology. So. I don't know exactly how to answer the question because I don't know which one is gonna is gonna break through. But right now we know what we know, and I think we're looking more of a, another ten years or so of of advancement in the technology we already know. Great transition to the next question, which is about electric vehicles. Uh, I'm excited to hear about the development of a Colorado Springs electric vehicle readiness plan. How do you see utilities in the city of Colorado Springs uh, work around electric vehicles supporting the statewide uh, decarbonization goals? And an additional part is as citizens, how can we help with electric vehicle efforts and how can we stay informed on CSU's work on decarbonizing transportation? So, so we have a group of engineers are, are preparing for the first first question about the collaboration with the city. We're all we're all on the same page. So, we, uh, utilities and the city, there's no difference in the way we look at the advancement of these initiatives we have. So, electric vehicles is we're we're we are totally engaged with each other as far as what we do in order for us to advance. Uh, the the infrastructure for electric vehicle penetration. So uh, on one hand, we want to make sure that the buyers of electric vehicles uh, are comfortable buying the vehicles because we are thinking about the infrastructure that we have to put in place for them to feel comfortable that they will be going around the city and the neighborhoods around the city um, and we have enough charging stations and infrastructure. But I think the bigger question you asked is 
regional collaboration. So whether it's from here to Denver, from Denver to Grand Junction, whether it's from uh, here to uh, Santa Fe, you know, there's there's a certain ev evolution of regional collaboration that needs to happen in order for us to have these infrastructure along main arteries. Uh, the, the state of Colorado has put in, um, you know, uh, is part of the uh, uh, Western states of how they would be advancing the in interstate infrastructure. But I think we just have to take it one step at a time. So if I can organize it in my in in a plan, it would be the city infrastructure, which has, uh, for example, uh, level two charging stations or level level three DC charging stations all over the city that people feel very comfortable that they're not going to be stranded by the airport because we don't have an infrastructure there or they're going to have to think through where, where do I stop? Where do I charge? Where do I go? How do I get out of this thing? So, and I think, I think we're getting better at figuring out the behavioral changes and, and how people live and where we should put these infrastructure in. But I think the bigger prize is going to be when we can collaborate with regional entities so we can put level three charging stations along the highways and, and where people can get a cup of coffee and charge their vehicle in 10 minutes uh, and, and, and keep on going. We're always going to compare to when you fill up your gas tank, it takes you about two minutes and then you pay and then you're on your way. And, and we're getting close to that, but we're not there yet. So people have to adjust to, you know, maybe 10 minute charging as the fastest we can do right now. But again, technology and, and planning is going to take over that fear that, that we are uh, basically randomly putting these things in. So the plan that we have in place is going to cover those kind of behavioral changes, working with the dealers and the manufacturers and uh, government agencies. So like we are putting in, uh, the utilities is putting in infrastructure internally because we're going to start uh, with our own fleet, electrifying our own fleet, where, where electric vehicle makes very much sense for us to have, you know, point A to point B uh, uh, transportation for employees or connectivity of our facilities. And we're going to switch to electric uh, uh, vehicles. We're looking at heavy equipment, you know, where we have in neighborhoods, you know, where where our crews go up uh, on, a, on an aerial platforms, you know, where we can have, instead of keeping the engine on, power the lift, that uh, they can go and, and do their jobs. You know, we will switch to electric platforms. It's much quieter, much cleaner, and we won't disturb the neighborhood by having these heavy equipment running in the neighborhoods. So we're looking at that. We're looking at charging station. We're looking at all of these pieces and how much investments we're going to see. You're going to see a you're going to see a huge focus on these type of programs. You know. Uh, collaboration, infrastructure, transportation. Um, you know, we're, we're also going to be collaborating with DOT on uh, shuttles and buses that are electric, you know, that that could be on our main ar arteries, you know, to, to transport people uh, with electric uh, buses. So hang in there. We're, we're figuring it out. Uh, and if I could add that in the more distant future, the benefits uh, go both ways too. When you start mating smart uh, grid with vehicle to grid technology, uh, it opens up a huge distributed battery that uh, utilities could use to, to shift loads to at some point. And we're a few years away from that, but um, yeah. And this, oh. this is kind of a similar uh, comment I made about you don't want to curtail renewables. It's a perfect storage for us to have in the homes, having a battery being charged by, by renewables that, that we don't know where to put at night and we don't have storage for them. And this is a perfect location for us to store that energy that we could be used for transportation. 
you've got to love our members here. So uh, a few people wrote in with the Mill Street Plan. Uh, it can be found at uh, coloradosprings.gov forward slash Mill Street Plan. No spaces, all one word. Perfect, thank you for looking it up. <laughs> and uh, you opened up a can of worms, uh, Mr. Benjamin, when you said, uh, quote, uh, email me, because we have a question here, can we get your email address? Yes. I will leave that up to you, whether you want to uh, go yeah. ahead and, and announce that. You you have my email, if you want to distribute it, I'm fine. Oh, but you're you're comfortable with, with that? Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see, uh, we have five minutes, uh, let's, oh, here's a very good question. Uh, will, will there be a day when we have an official closing ceremony where we honor the men and women who ran the Martin Drake, uh, and they can be recognized by the community? Yes. Uh, not only are we going to do that, this is, this is something that we cannot just walk away from. A historic uh, achievement for building this power plant 60 years ago, 70 years ago. It has its it had its its um, uh, place in the history of developing the city, and we might have a small uh, museum of the history of the development of the power plant and the city development. You know, just for generations to come and 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 see the history of what has happened. Um, you know, we, we are moving forward, but also we need to look back and we need to see how that that uh, power plant played a huge role in economic development of the city. Uh, let's see, um, what is the timeline for front range power? And for, for those listening that don't uh, know, front range is a, a natural gas plant uh, co-located down by Ray Nixon uh, coal plant. So the plans right now for front range is to uh, modernize it. I mean, uh, it's not that old, but it's old technology. Like I said, you know, we it's a 500 megawatts of uh, gas generation that is being is going to be used less and less you know as we add more renewables and batteries but it's still going to be still needed for you know all the the valleys that we have to fill in right now until technology kicks in but right now the plans uh, we don't have any plans for decommissioning it until we see what the technology is going to look like 10 15 years from now but i think what we get what what you're going to see is uh, maybe 50 million plus investment in modernizing the controls and the way we operate the plant so it's much much efficient much less emissions and much more um, fast acting up and down you know compared to the uh, the way it was designed you know some 15 years ago I think we have time for one more, and I apologize uh, to all the people whose questions I didn't get to. We just have a lot of interest in in this talk, but uh, let's see, for the last question, is CSU able to, prov to provide more energy audits to commercial customers? Yes, so we have, we have large customers that we have uh, customer reps. We actually had the meeting uh, a couple of days ago on segmenting uh, our small our large customers you know like uh, the universities uh, the bases and uh, large manufacturing uh, we have the medium size uh, you know customers that we want to pay attention to and again you know because of this this whole economic uh, reshift that we're seeing I mean small businesses are suffering and we want to also shift some of our focus to the small business and, and do audits, direct installs, uh, rebates, anything we can do to, to ease the pain on the small businesses and help help, help each of these segments. Uh, we, have, we have a, uh, a group of uh, representatives you know, that represent these segments. And we're going to be very active in going to them, knocking on their door, and uh, and helping them do audits, uh, provide technical support, provide 
uh, financial help where we need to and make sure that we're there as partners so they can stand on their feet and actually thrive. Well, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Benjamin. Um, I'd like to end with uh, a little anecdote and a couple administrative comments. Um, just from a personal perspective, uh, I knew when we had entered a new era and had the right leader at the helm of Colorado Springs Utilities when I attended the very first public meeting of the last EIRP. This is the very first public meeting, uh, Mr. Benjamin's first. Uh, meeting with the public on the new IRP. And within the first 15 minutes, uh, his senior managers uh, used the C words, climate change. <laughs> it may, may seem like a small thing, but um, prior to his tenure, that never would have happened. And uh, I, I knew that we we were embarking on a new positive and productive path forward uh, at that point. And uh, we can't thank you enough for your for your leadership and what has come out of this last EIRP and um, the vision that you're bringing to a clean energy future for Colorado Springs. So thank you very much. We greatly appreciate you uh, talking with us tonight. It's an honor to serve the city and, and I'm extremely honored to be part of that. We did have a question about uh, whether we can release these slides. Uh, do you have any problem with me um, no. sending these slides out uh, no, to it's... people request? So yeah. on the registration, there was um, my uh, email address, uh, j.riggins, R-I-G-G-I-N-S, at cres, C-R-E-S, dash energy, dot org. Uh, and if you send me an email, uh, I can send you a copy of the slides for um, anybody that uh, would like them. And with that, I want to say thank you to everyone that attended tonight. I um, greatly appreciate that. And thank you again, Mr. Benjamin. Thank you. Thank you. Have a safe uh, trip home if you're driving. Take care. <laughs> Thanks. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye.